Rock art has been a part of human culture and history for millennia. Even before the invention of writing, people were drawing pictures inside deep caves or on stone promontories or on the walls of buildings. It's occurred over space and time. There's graffiti on the walls of Pompeii. There's 2,000-year-old Roman graffiti complaining that the Egyptian tomb of Ramses VI was boring. In the United States, there's famous places like Independence Rock near Alcova, Wyoming, where pioneers scrape their names on the sides of the rock, and there are many other places like that, perhaps the most interesting of which is in western New Mexico, where a sandstone promontory in an ancient pueblo for centuries served as a stopping place for travelers from the earliest days of European settlement. Charles F. Lummis, who's a journalist and an activist for the preservation of antiquities, said of the stones of El Moro, certainly all the other rocks in America do not, in their entirety, hold so much of American history. It is history that deserves to be remembered. While still a matter of debate, the Pecos classification dates the emergence of the ancestral Pueblo culture to the 12th century BC. They have been identified as the precursors to the modern Pueblo peoples, such as the Zuni, Acoma, Hopi, and Taos. The Spanish gave them the name when they first explored this area in the 16th century, in reference to their multi-story adobe and stone villages. The term Anasazi was once used to describe these ancestral Puebloans, but has been rejected by the modern Puebloans because the Navajo word is an exonym, meaning ancient enemy, or perhaps ancestors of our enemy, referring to their competition with Puebloan peoples in the region. The ancestral Puebloan culture is one of three major cultural traditions that existed in what is today the American Southwest, the other two being the Mogollon and the Hohokam cultures. The ancestral Puebloan culture is known widely for three UNESCO World Heritage Sites, Mesa Verde, Chaco Canyon, where Pueblo Benita lies, and the Taos Pueblo, which is still inhabited and is one of the oldest continually inhabited communities in North America. Some of the buildings in Chaco Canyon are among the largest built in North America before the 19th century. In the late 1200s AD, a group of ancestral Puebloans built what would become an 875-room mesa-top Pueblo surrounding a central courtyard. Strictly speaking, El Moro is not a mesa, but a cuesta, kind of a ridge with a gentle slope on one side and a steeper slope on the other. The site would have been home to up to 1,500 people. The site was situated along an ancient trade route called the Zuni Acoma Trail, which led 73 miles between the Acoma and Zuni Pueblos. Most importantly, the site holds the only large pool of water within 30 miles, providing an oasis-like stopping place for travelers. The Zuni called the site Atsana, or Place of Writings, on the rock. The site was abandoned by 1400, for reasons still debated and unclear, but coinciding with the general southward movement of the Puebloan peoples into the Pueblos the Spanish would visit in the 16th century. Though abandoned, the site is home to a large number of ancient petroglyphs left by the original inhabitants. Though often outshone by the carvings left later, the bighorn sheep, handprints, human figures, cocapelli, and geometric designs are the oldest marks left at El Moro, the old voices of the original inhabitants in its Mesa Top Pueblo. After the Spanish had conquered the Aztec Empire in 1521 and established a presence in modern Mexico, they sought to expand. The name Nuevo Mexico does not refer to the country of Mexico, which it predates, but is actually a reference to the Aztecs. The Spanish had an obsession with the rumored seven cities of gold, which they thought were somewhere north of the Rio Grande. They named the region Santa Fe de Nuevo Mexico, Saint Faith of New Mexico, to reflect their belief that there was more treasure to be found like that of the Aztecs, whose capital lay in the valley of Mexico. Francisco Vasquez de Coronado traveled through the region in the 1540s, and in 1581, Franciscan brother Fray Agustin Rodriguez came and stayed at one of the pueblos with the hope of converting the locals. Antonio de Espejo later went in search of Rodriguez, and after discovering he had been killed, left the first European description of El Moro, where he stayed on March 11, 1583. He called it El Estanque de Penol, or the Pool of the Great Rock. The first known European to leave his mark at El Moro was Juan de Oñata, who crossed the Rio Grande on April 30, 1598. Before he did, Oñata claimed all the territory across the river for the Spanish Empire. Oñate was governor of the region until 1610 and passed by El Moro several times before he decided to leave his mark there in 1605. Oñate's legacy in the region is a troubled one, as shortly after his arrival he perpetrated what is known as the Acoma Massacre. The Spaniards demanded food from the Acoma Pueblo, but the Pueblo refused as they needed the supplies themselves. A skirmish broke out that killed 11 Spaniards, including Oñate's nephew. 
Onyata ordered the Pueblo destroyed in January 1599, where an estimated 800 to 1,000 Akama were killed. 500 survivors were punished harshly, all older than 12 were enslaved for 20 years, and all men over 25 had one foot amputated. This action would in part lead to his conviction by Spanish authorities on a dozen charges including cruelty to natives and colonists. He was banned from the territory for life. The inscriptions at El Maro after Añate tell the story of life on an extreme frontier for European colonizers. Spanish soldiers, missionaries, and governors left Paso por aquí, pass by here, with dates and sometimes a message describing the work of colonization. A mark left in 1620 says, Captain General of the provinces of New Mexico for the King our Lord, he passed by here in returning from the pueblos of Zuni on the 29th of July of the year 1620, and he put them at peace at their petition. Another from 1632 records Spanish soldiers going to the Zuni pueblos to avenge the death of a priest. In 1636, Captain Sergeant Major Juan de Archuleta and two other Spanish officers left their marks at the site. Governor Nieto in 1629 even left poetry. The Spanish called the site El Moro, meaning the headland or the bluff. The inscriptions also illustrate the principal goals of Spanish colonization, Christianization, and subjugation. Many of the inscriptions speak of subduing the nearby Hopi and Zuni, recording the tribes Anu gave their obedience, often shortly followed by reprisal trips for the murder of priests. The Spanish employed a pair of systems called command and distribution, which demanded labor and tribute from the natives in exchange for protection, Christianity, and the Spanish language. In practice, these systems amounted to a kind of slavery and were accompanied by treatment of the natives so brutal that even some Spaniards complained. In New Mexico, the Spanish demanded tribute mostly in the form of food and forced Pueblo Indians to work without pay. The Native Americans were also caught in a power struggle between secular governors and the priests. Pedro de Peralta, the governor who succeeded Oñata, was arrested by a Franciscan friar who used power over the whole territory. Both governors and priests accused the other of mistreating the Pueblo and abusing their power. Between 1610 and 1670, at least three New Mexico governors were excommunicated and two tried by the Spanish Inquisition. Friars even helped incite a revolt against one governor. Bernardo Lopez, governor from 1659 to 1660, and his successor, Diego de Peñalosa, both allowed Native Americans to practice their own religion, which the Franciscans didn't like. While the Spanish were turning El Moro into a record of their movements in the territory, the Pueblo were growing sick of their treatment, which seemed to go unchecked even when they appealed to the government in Mexico City. In 1680, they had finally had enough. During the 1670s, droughts, raided by Apache and other nomadic tribes and diseases, ravaged their communities. Neither the Spanish nor the priests were able to protect them, so many turned back to their old religions. This incited repression from the friars, who arrested a number of Pueblo, including one named Pope. Pope led the Pueblos to revolt as a group in August of 1680, and the Spanish were ousted from the territory. The Spanish fled to El Paso, where they tried to regroup. There are no inscriptions at El Moro dated between 1680 and 1692, but the situation didn't improve under Pope. When the Spanish returned under General Diego de Vargas in 1692, he pacified most of the region bloodlessly and left a note of his victory at El Moro. Here was the General, Don Diego de Vargas, who conquered for our holy faith and for the royal crown all the New Mexico at his expense, year of 1692. Still, the decades that followed were rife with discontent and conflict between the Spanish and the Pueblos, as evidence in their continued notes left on the stone. The last Spanish inscription is by an Andreas Romero in 1774. We know nothing about him. New Spain made a series of reforms to help Nuevo Mexico in the late 1700s, but at the turn of the century the mother country fell apart after the invasion by Napoleon, which was followed by decades of instability. Mexico gained its independence from Spain in 1821, but faced even greater instability. The leadership changed dozens of times in the 50 years after independence. New Mexico became increasingly isolated, plagued by Comanche raids and widespread poverty that Mexico was unwilling or unable to curb. There's only one known inscription during the Mexican period, a simple OR, 1836. If the locals camped there, they left the site undisturbed. The United States took most of New Mexico in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. U.S. soldiers and survey teams quickly poured into the region, and among them was James Hervey Simpson, a U.S. Army officer in the Corps of Topographical Engineers, the department that was merged with the Corps of Engineers during the Civil War. He was tasked with surveying a road from Santa Fe to the Navajo lands, and brought with him several artists to document the trip in watercolor, including Richard H. Kern and his brother Edward. 
They traveled with a contingent of American soldiers commanded by Colonel John Washington, who was tasked with making a treaty with the Navajo. On September 17, 1849, they met a man on the road called Mr. Lewis, a trader familiar with the area. He offered to take Simpson to El Moro, claiming he could show them half an acre of inscriptions. Despite their doubts, Simpson, his servant called Bird, and Richard Kern went with him. There they found both the ancient rock art and the many Spanish inscriptions. They spent two days there exploring the side, and Kern made facsimiles of the existing inscriptions. He left his own note in the stone. Lieutenant J. H. Simpson, USA, and R. H. Kern, artists, visited and copied these inscriptions. September 17, 1849. Though he forgot the R in the inscription and had to add it afterwards. They are the first known Americans to leave their mark at El Moro. Kern left another inscription a few feet to the right of the first. R. H. Kern, August 29, 1851. Kern was killed by Paiute Indians two years later on an expedition in Utah. The site remained an important site for soldiers and wagon trains moving west from Santa Fe into the new American territories. In 1857, a unique party came to the pool at the Rock. Twenty-five camels led by Edward F. Beale, diplomat, general, and frontiersman. Beale had actually signed on to survey a road between Santa Fe and the California border, only to learn afterwards that it was expected to test the use of camels brought from Tunis. Though Bill did not leave his inscription, several in his party did, including E. Penn Long, short for Edward Pendleton Long, who left his inscription in careful calligraphy. P. Gilmer Brackenridge also left a distinct and precise inscription on the rocks. Beale claimed he would rather have a camel than a mule, but ultimately his army would decline to use them. Some did escape, and sightings of feral camels persisted in the region until after 1900. The first party of immigrants to use Beale's wagon road arrived in 1858. Many of them left their marks, including P. H. Williamson, Isaac Holland, John Udell, Rose Bailey, and 12-year-old Sally Fox. The party was attacked by members of the Mojave tribe shortly after their visit as they were preparing to cross the Colorado River into California, and along with numerous casualties, Sally was pierced by an arrow in the chest. She survived the wound to die at 67 in California. A children's book was written based on her story and published in 1995. Many others would leave their mark on the rocks between 1858 and 1880. When the first railroad was put through the area in 1881, it passed 25 miles north of the rock, which had come to be known as Inscription Rock. This dramatically decreased the number of visitors, though some still did leave their mark. In 1906, Congress passed the Antiquities Act, which allowed Theodore Roosevelt to declare natural landmarks as monuments if they were of scientific interest. The first monument was Devil's Tower on September 24, 1906, but El Moro and Montezuma Castle were made monuments shortly after on December 8th. Officially, this meant that no more carvings were allowed at the site, although the policy was not well enforced until 1920, and some later inscriptions remain. The National Park Service now cares for the site, and in 1933, built a path that leads to the top of the mesa, where the ruins of the Atzina Pueblo were partially excavated in the 1950s. In the 1940s, the Park Service determined that the pool was not fed by a spring, but by snowmelt and runoff. Park Service's priority today is to document and preserve the some 2,000 inscriptions in the soft stone that they mark. The ancient rock art left by the ancestral Puebloans is still visible, next to essentially a stone guest book that keeps track of four centuries of passers-by, their signatures representing personal bits, snippets of their history, tiny pieces of a larger historical narrative. It now lies along New Mexico's Trails of the Ancients Byway and was declared an International Dark Sky Park in December 2019. Today visitors can see the over 2,000 signatures, dates, and petroglyphs for no cost. If you're willing to climb a bit, you can reach the ruins of the ancient Pueblo and get a commanding view of the countryside. Even though El Moro no longer serves as a guest book, the long history of the writings in the stone and the thousands of people who still come to see them leaves us to question. What marks are we leaving to be found by future travelers? I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.